time it is. Marvin Devine, Hoover, Axel, and you know how we do. <laughs> yeah, I got the juice, yeah, I got the juice We game cool, make them look like cool Always play cool, that's the biggest rule Fuck that what they doing, keep on doing I am your host, Steve Belcher. Share this broadcast because tonight's show is going to be a great show. It's going to be a lot of information, things that you probably never even heard before about genomics. So share this broadcast. You can know someone or even yourself be at stage three, stage four, stage five kidney disease and not start dialysis. Tune in, share this broadcast. We got Dr. David Moskowitz, MD, CEO and founder of Genomed Incorporated out of Hollywood, Florida. So tonight, this is going to be an awesome show. Again, share this broadcast because you could know someone dealing with kidney disease right now, possibly on their way to kidney failure and you might have hope. So without further ado, let's bring on our special guest. Let me give him the special VIP welcome. Dr. Moskowitz, how you doing? Steve, it's great to be on the show with you. Yeah, welcome back, because you was on our show maybe 
somewhere about almost a year and a half to two years ago. That sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. So how has it been since? Oh, about the same. <laughs> Not much difference. COVID. I got a treatment for COVID. Uh, We're going to talk about that because I've I seen that. Um, what's the name of that? Med, I mean, that um, it's not a medication, but that yeah, it's a, a, a plant product. It's a, a flavonoid that makes things yellow, makes flowers yellow. It's called quercetin or quercetin. And it's, uh, you know, it's Q-U-E-R-C-E-T-I-N. And um, maybe half a gram twice a day in adults, much less in kids based on weight. And um, you have to titrate up the dose till your symptoms go away and then stay at that dose for a couple of weeks and uh, it'll uh, kick COVID symptoms right away. Really? The uh, shortness of breath and a lot of stuff like that? Yeah. So my first case was probably my most dramatic. He was an asthmatic. He, he knew he wasn't having asthma. He'd been sick for a month. And, excuse me, and uh, I had him on really high-dose prednisone. I started at 60 milligrams. I had to double to 120. He was still doing really poorly. Um, he had chest tightness where he couldn't take a breath. And he went to the ER. They wouldn't take him because his O2 sat was still, you know, above 90. But he, he was in agony breathing, but it was never like any asthma attack he'd had in the previous 14 years. And then he starts taking quinapril, uh, sorry, not quinapril, quercetin, the other cue I'm going to talk about. And uh, within 16 hours, after right after his second dose, he felt back to normal. Wow. Wow. What? Let me ask you this. So... Why is not a big talk about this? Um, well, I, I think as we're going to talk about with kidney disease again, there's money in illness. And uh, there are billions of dollars that have already uh, essentially t been taken from taxpayers and given to four companies, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna. Um, and so this huge wealth transfer has already occurred thanks to public health authorities. And, um, and you know, the last thing anybody wants to hear in the media or in the healthcare industry is that you don't need, you know, a multi-billion dollar vaccine program. You can just buy Corsetin from over the counter from Amazon or the vitamin shop or GNC or any drug store or any grocery store that, that will have it on the shelves and you can cure yourself of COVID symptoms. They don't want you to know that. Wow. Just the symptoms, but not the disease. Well, that's all that there is. I mean, um, if you can cure the symptoms, so the big problem with with, um, with COVID is it may start off as just a runny nose, but four days later, in, in a subset of people, maybe 2% of people, it progresses to chest tightness and lung failure and acute respiratory distress syndrome. And so in, in those four days, you have to escalate the dose of quercetin. If you can make the symptoms go away, then you know you're not going to die. Mm. Wow! Uh, before we hear, look, you know, a little bit about your background, I have a, a person watching named Joyce Monroe, uh -huh. and she says, "Steve, I'm stage three CKD. I'm so scared. I'm so scared, afraid I'll have to go on dialysis. My mom was on dialysis. It was awful. For so, Dr. Moskowitz, for someone like." Joyce, what could Genomed Incorporate do for her to um, ease her anxiety of being afraid that she may have to go on dialysis at stage? Well, and then we know she got two more stages, but 
What could Gino Med do for someone like her to assure her that it's a possibility a possibility that may not happen? So, uh, so Joyce is contacting you at precisely the right time where we want to do battle with CKD. Stage three means that her, uh, her kidney function, her estimated glomerular filtration rate, her EGFR has dropped below 60, essentially 60%. So stage three is anywhere from 30 to 60. The, the higher the number, the better chance we have of getting her back into stage two. If we can get her back into stage two, she'll never go on dialysis. Mm. Wow, wow. So tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, Dr. Moskowitz. Um, how did you end up here being founder CEO of uh, GenoMed? But before you do that, can you just explain just briefly, what is genomics or genomics and how does it relate to kidney disease? Well, you're taking me all the way back uh, to 1993. So in 1993, I had been doing research for um, about seven years already on renal hypertrophy. That was my project. And as a renal fellow, you have to pick some project in the lab uh, to uh, in most renal fellowships. So mine was on renal hypertrophy, which is when you take one kidney out, the other one starts to grow within minutes. And um, I wanted to find out what the growth factor was, the renotropin, and I wanted to give that to people in kidney failure to make their kidney grow more and keep them off dialysis. Uh, to my surprise, the renotropin in 1993, I discovered, was actually causing the renal failure. It was angiotensin II. Um, and so uh, instead of uh, being good for you, uh, we had to block production of angiotensin II. But people have been using ACE inhibitors for 10 years already. Genomic epi, genomic epidemiology, showed me that overactivity of ACE was connected with dialysis in most cases. And so I, genomic epi gave me the confidence to, to uh, pursue ACE inhibitors some more. So at first I thought um, maybe some of these newer ACE inhibitors would work. I tried out Ramapril because it was more hydrophobic. I used higher doses, and uh, Ramapril didn't do anything different. But when I, I used Quinapril, which turned out to be on the formulary and was no trouble at all to order, at high doses, the very first patient I tried it in uh, dropped his creatinine. He, was, he came to me the month before at 3.1. He should have been up to 3.3 the next month but instead he dropped down to 2.8. And I've been taught that that would never happen. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. So evidently you have a background in biology. I, I uh, or bio, biochem, I yeah. I, Biochemistry? Yeah, I have a master's in biochem. Mm. Now, Dr. Moskowitz, uh, question. Why is the BK virus so hard to eradicate out of transplant patients? I have a friend right now who um, had a transplant and she had the virus, but it won't leave her system. And let me get the medication she told me she was taking. Um, it, let me see. Uh, Sidovavir, mm -hmm. Sidovavir, um, and the IVG. Why, if if they can suppress the virus for HIV and and other certain viruses, why not the BK virus? Why is well, that so? Why is always raise his ugly head? I have to tell you, I know nothing about this. All I know is. Um, 
I, I used to be interested in BK virus. It's very common. Um, even in, in normal people, immunocompetent people, uh, it's very common to have BK virus in the urine. In transplant patients who are immunosuppressed, I can, I can imagine that it's essentially always going to be there. I don't know why they would treat it because it used to be thought benign, um, you know, when I looked into it. But that was, you know, a couple of decades ago. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. I don't know why they're trying to get rid of something that may just be a normal opportunistic bug. Mm -hmm. Well, this particular uh, bug is causing someone's kidney function to decline rapidly. You sure it's not the, um, the antiviral drug? Hmm. I never questioned that. Well, I mean, acyclovir, when it first came out, was causing acute kidney failure. It was very dose dependent. Same with valocyclovir, Valtrex. I think all these antivirals um, can actually cause uh, renal failure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, uh, Dr. Uh, Moskowitz, we had a question from Joyce Monroe. She said, how do you go back a stage with CKD? Well, I would encourage Joyce to contact me at genomed.com if she wants me to actually, you know, call in the meds. Um, but what I do after she contacted me is I'd, I'd send out a questionnaire asking her for more details, like what meds she's taking, specifically what blood pressure pills she was taking, and whether she'd ever had an allergy to ACE inhibitors. And if she was okay, I would give her quinapril, and I would push the dose as high as we could go. Um, but generally, I use a milligram per pound. So if Joyce weighs, let's say, 200 pounds, um, I don't mean to insult her, but I, I also don't want to, you know, go low either. Um, I weigh I weigh close to 280. Let's take my example. I'm 280. Um, Quinapril comes in 40 milligram pills, so there that would be seven uh, Quinapril tablets a day to equal my weight in milligrams. So you could split it up three in the morning or four in the morning, three at night, or you could just take four twice a day. Anyway, once I got myself to four twice a day, um, then I would start, I would just stay at that dose and look to see what was happening with the creatinine. And if the creatinine didn't, didn't level off or start to go down, then I'd go up a little bit on the quinapril because it doesn't look like there's any upper limit of how much you can use as long as you control potassium with a second drug called Florinef. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow, so why, I know it's gonna get back to money, but why is this type of treatment not promoted as an alternative to kind of help uh, keep patients off dialysis? Well, I, I think there are a few minor hurdles and then the major hurdle. The major hurdle is, um, you know, a dialysis patient. If Joyce goes on to dialysis like her mother, um, her, she's worth 100000 a year to whoa, the healthcare whoa. system. How much? 100000 which Medicare happily pays. Wait a minute. Medicare pays for each patient a hundred thousand dollars a year for hemodialysis treatment. Yep, half a million people on dialysis. Um, thirty, uh, sorry, thirty-five billion a year. Thirty-five billion. Seven percent of Medicare's budget. And when I went to Medicare in October of two thousand four, and told them I could prevent ninety percent of dialysis, they had zero interest because I was going to eliminate tens of thousands of bureaucrats' jobs. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Mosser, we had a question from Sheila L. She says, so while you're taking these meds and are on dialysis, do you still go to dialysis? But you wouldn't be on dialysis if you were taking these meds, correct? Yeah, it's an excellent question. So once you go on dialysis, the game is over. Um, your kidneys shut down. I don't know how to how to resurrect them. Um, but I can keep people off, even if they're at stage five, like you said early, earlier in the show. If they're at stage five, they've been told they absolutely have to go on dialysis. It's time for vascular access. I can still keep people off for a couple of years. I have one lady in Houston who's been off since June of 2018, so a little over two and a half years, who was told she had to start dialysis then. Uh, Dr. Moskowitz, what about the symptoms? Will they um, exacerbate, like say if someone is at stage five at say 10%, 8% mm-hmm. at the uh, so, some of the classic uh, symptoms like nausea, vomiting, uh, pitting edema, and anemia. Would you conservatively treat and manage those symptoms while you're still um, trying to maintain that kidney function with that treatment? Well, um, so the big thing is the BUN. Seems like most of the symptoms that you mentioned, the nausea, vomiting, um, have to do more with the uremia, with the BUN. And BUN is very sensitive to how much protein is in the diet. So if you're in stage five and you want to stay off the machine, not go on it in the first place, you have to crash your protein intake down to a gram per kilo. So if I weigh 280, um, that's like 120, 140, maybe 130 kilos. So I wouldn't be able to eat more than 130 grams of um, protein. There's like 25 grams per ounce. So that's about six ounces. I just had a hamburger tonight for eight ounces. I exceeded how much protein I could eat. In, in the entire day, you really have to have a protein deficient diet to be able to do this thing with the, you know, in stage five. That's why I recommend uh, that everybody know their creatinine now and start as soon as they can because um, starting in stage three is a whole lot easier. You don't have to modify your diet, that's the main thing. And you have a much better chance of success of avoiding the dialysis machine altogether. Now, could you do the same with, say, someone who had a transplant and their um, kidney function was starting to decline? Could the same principle be applied to post-transplant patients who may start going into acute rejection? Well, um. I would need to collaborate with transplant surgeons on that. Um, They traditionally have uh, have kind of run the case. I think they're now transplant nephrologists who do a lot. But, um, you know, there's always, so I'm not going to touch it. I won't touch a transplant patient. But it does seem to me a good idea um, since... Uh, what's causing kidney failure in when there are two kidneys is probably the same thing that's going to cause kidney failure when there's only one transplanted kidney. And uh, that is overactivity of ACE. Surgeons haven't been uh, eager to use ACE inhibitors in transplanting kidneys because there's a single artery fitting into the kidney And if there's a stenosis in a single renal artery and there's only one kidney, you get acute renal failure. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that you would try the, you'd try the ACE inhibitor. If the creatinine shot up in a few days, you'd stop it. And then the creatinine would fall. You'd never get 
you never get permanent renal failure using the NACE inhibitor, even in stenotic, in the unilateral, uh, when there's only one kidney in a, a stenotic renal artery. So I don't know why transplant surgeons are so afraid of using ACE inhibitors, but I think you'll find no transplant patient is on an ACE inhibitor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now, now when, when you talk about kidney disease and, and possibly slowing the progression and even possibly pulling back maybe at stage three or possibly Mm -hmm. taking the patient back one stage. Um, does this pertain to also genetic problems like PKD or kidney cancer or lupus or anything other that may uh, cause the kidneys to fail? Or are we specifically just looking at diabetes and hypertension um, being those culprits? Well, so I, you know, polycystic kidney disease is 5% of dialysis, and I've long been interested, uh, but I don't have a treatment for it yet. Um, so no, it doesn't work for that. Um, it does work for 90% of dialysis, so the common stuff, diabetes number one, hypertension number two, so that's a good place to start. Um, it, it happens, I mean, I would love to get more patients with FSGS, IgA, um, but they're rare, fortunately. Um, I got one patient with fibrillary glomerulonephritis and goosing him with quinapril over a period of time, a couple of years, actually did drop his creatinine. So I think it's going to work with other glomerulonephritides. What I've lacked so far for the past 25 years is any kind of nephrology collaboration. Nobody in the nephrology community even wants to hear about this, let alone work with me. Oh, I can understand that. You'd be cutting in that money. <laughs> uh Dr. Moskowitz, please, let's go back. Uh, Jared A. Brown, who's host of the Warriors Quest show that we have on the Urban Health Outreach Media Network, he wants uh, to know if you can expound on ACE inhibitors. Uh, I know we were talking about it, and we know the lingo, which is a, a blood pressure medication, but uh, can you just uh, explain in the simplest form what an ACE inhibitor is? Right. So I see Jared's question. I appreciate it. He, he asked whether an ACE inhibitor is the same thing as a binder. A binder, I'm thinking, must be to bind phosphate. Um, and it's not the same thing as a phosphate binder. An ACE inhibitor is, uh, Steve, like you said, a, a, a pure blood pressure pill. What's interesting about ACE inhibitors is that since the 70s or 80s, blacks have been denied ACE inhibitors uh, because they are thought to have low renin hypertension. Uh, this was um, this was a sort of the I mean they do the renin levels aren't that high. ACE inhibitors are not that effective at lowering blood pressure in blacks, and and so still. ACE inhibitors are not given to blacks very much. They're, uh, blacks are generally treated with thiazide diuretics more than anything else, at least that I can see. They're very effective, but they don't do a thing to delay uh, renal failure. So what ACE inhibitors do is specifically inhibit this, this enzyme, ACE. And ACE is what um, makes the kidney grow. ACE is a mechanosensor, um, and when the blood comes into the, uh, the glomerulus and crosses the glomerular basement membrane and goes into the early part of the proximal tubule, it, um, it stimulates, it makes, it mechanically um, stimulates these ACE inhibitors that are like palm fronds and that are sitting outside on the, um, the outside surface of these proximal tubule cells. They look like 
intestinal cells. They have brush border uh, microvilli to absorb as much solid as possible. And, and so it's this motion, this mechanical uh, opening of the ACE inhibitor that actually allows substrate angiotensin one to get into the into uh, the active site of the enzyme. The the top of ACE has these sugars, like a like a tree or palm fronds, and normally the box is closed, but with the motion of the extra blood flow, they open up. Uh, angiotensin one gets into the inside which is like a pencil sharpener. It clips off the last two amino acids of angiotensin one, making it into an, an octopeptide, angiotensin two, and then it rapidly leaves and causes um, a first growth, but if too much is around, actually apoptosis or cell suicide of all the tubules. Let uh, me ask you this, Doc. And fibrosis. Uh, because you was talking a lot of chemistry there, but in general, a lot of physicians say that ACE and ARBs, uh, which is another uh, uh, pressure medicine, that it helps block protein from getting into the urine. Right. Well, so what had been discovered, so I did my stuff at starting 93, 94, but in the 80s, people had already shown that that ACE inhibitors like captopril, they all ended pril, captopril and allopril, um, had dropped protein levels in the urine. And they, they were good, and they were drug of choice for, for nephrotic syndrome, for anybody with proteinuria, which diabetics and hypertensives uh, often get. But um, they were using it at low doses, number one, and um, uh, I've sort of lost my train of thought here. What, what were you asking? Um, what I had. Oh, uh, ARBs. Sorry, ARBs. Right. right. Well, the ARBs had the same reduction of protein. The thing is that they weren't using the high dose of ACE inhibitor. They didn't see much difference between ACE inhibitors and ARBs. I've tried ARBs. ARBs don't work. So people think losartan is useful. It's not useful at all. You really have to goose people with quinapril, not any other ACE inhibitor in my experience. And, um, and ARBs don't substitute, although perhaps in people who don't have enough blood pressure to give them quinapril, maybe high-dose ARB might help. So high-dose avapro, herbosartan, high-dose... Um, uh, so herbosartan, candesartan, some of the sartans might help, but that all remains to be shown. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Now, tell us, let's go back to your patient in, in Houston that you said you kept off dialysis now for the last two years. Um, how did she know about you and at what stage was this uh, client at when she reached out to you for for help? Well, I think she had 15% uh, kidney function. She was being told to put in an access for dialysis. She didn't want to go on dialysis. Um, most of my people have, have come to me through Terry Cooksey's book. Um, and he's written a, a number of books. Unfortunately, he passed away from a stroke, but um, his creatinine dropped from four down to, to 1.5. It was normal. Uh, it was the most amazing wow. drop I've ever seen. He was one of your patients. Yeah, he was one of my patients, but by remote control. I mean, he lived in Arkansas. I was taking care of him by email. And, and he had this amazing response. And he... he also did a few other things. He he did some nutritional things. He avoided uh, high fructose corn syrup, which may have helped. Uh, I don't know really anything about it. Generally, the only nutritional change I make is in stage five people who I 
I have to tell that they tell them to avoid protein and potassium. But uh, but my Houston patient, I think, read his book. And that's the only way people know about me so far. I'm hoping that uh, maybe this will go viral. Mm-hmm. Now, does does this patient get monthly lab work? How often do they get their blood work drawn? Well, she has a regular nephrologist who I'm sure gets monthly. For a while, he was I was asking him to get weekly labs on her uh, because at the beginning, uh, you have to be really careful with potassium. Um, you don't want it to go up too high. And the bicarb is also important. So, uh, but now I think it's every month. So the nephrologist work in conjunction with you. Um, how are you able to keep her off for two years? Uh, have her nephrologist approached her and said, look, it's time to do dialysis. How does that work out? Well, her nephrologist has told her many times to get access. And and then she then she asked me, and you know, she's been stable and she shares her labs with me. The nephrologist and I don't talk to each other. He doesn't I mean I'd be happy to talk to any nephrologist, but so far I haven't found any nephrologist willing to talk to me. The patient though is happy to talk to me and share labs with me. Um, and so, uh, she's essentially on autopilot. She's taking the same high dose of quinapril that, that I got her up on, uh, two and a half years ago and things seem to be stable, which amazes me. This is the longest run I've ever had. I've seen patients go a year before, but never two and a half. And, and what is her nephrologist? What does she say that her nephrologist is telling her, as far well, as he, why you know her not starting on dialysis? I think he is um, kind of can't believe that she's still off the machine, and keeps wanting her to get the access, and um, you know. It, is probably irritated with her. Really? So the patient do have the last say so, correct? Oh yeah, every patient has complete control over what help they'll accept and what help they'll refuse. Mm-hmm. Why doesn't why do patients don't really know that? Why do they pretty much I know they depend on the doctor to give them that information, but why do you think a lot of patients don't do their own research? Well, I mean, I've tried to um, to make Genome Ed more visible on Google. Like I, at one point I spent 15 grand on search engine optimization. Wow. But, it, you know, and for one day we were on the front page. We were maybe number one uh, if you if you put in kidney failure, but it didn't translate to any patients. So I think part of it is lack of budget um, for marketing. Number two is when people have something scary that, that they know they can die from, they tend to cling harder uh, to the doctor they have and ride out into the sunset with their, with their doctor. Very few people abandon, uh, you know, their partner in health at the time when they get sick. Although, in fact, that should be the time when you look around for a second opinion. Because if your doctor, you know, somehow didn't prevent you from getting to that to that stage, then maybe he's not the best doctor for your <clears throat> situation. Wow, you just said something that really resonated with me that I didn't really never even thought about after working in this field so long, you said if your doctor doesn't help prevent you from, uh, you know, the advancements of your kidney disease, then he's not the d- doctor for you. And that's true. But what would you say to patients who say, well, my doctor did try. They gave me this medicine. They told me to do this and they told me to do that. 
what would you say to our, our patients who would present that argument that they were treated medicinally? Um, does it go past just being treated with prescriptions, Dr. Moskowitz? No, I don't. I don't do anything other than. Um, no, use- no, no. I mean, far as with. Uh, a, a, a regular, you know, a nephrologist that a patient goes see. And when you mentioned that the nephrologist, if they don't try to help prevent a patient mm-hmm. from, you know, getting on dialysis or whatever, do you think it, it, it goes past that? Well, I think uh, everybody in the renal community, uh, National Kidney Foundation, ASN, um, Medicare, I think you ask any nephrologist, any renal nurse, Anna, um, any professional organization, and they'll swear up and down. They do everything possible to prevent renal failure. There is nothing that's more important to them. But when push comes to shove, and and I've called these people repeatedly for 25 years, they completely ignore me for one reason or another. I mean, uh, one dean of, of American nephrology who's written textbooks said that he was just too busy to let me quote his name in a press release. Come on. I mean, the truth is the NKF said, even though they take millions of, of dollars, from Coca-Cola, they couldn't mention Genomed because it would violate their 501c3 status, getting that close to a company. I mean, if, if you're raising money to prevent renal failure and a company happens to have done it, why can't you tell the rest of the people? Why do you keep asking for money to solve something that a company has already solved? If you're really serious about solving renal failure, you might just tell everybody that the solution is is here. But they're not serious about solving renal failure. And in fact, the entire healthcare system, starting with Medicare, the payer, um, and including hospitals and dialysis units and academic medical schools uh, are all getting way too much money off black people's backs. I mean, this is a form of medical racism. I mean, I agree with you 100% on on that because, you know, blacks are affected the most. They represent 13.2% of the U.S. population, but account for more than 32% uh, of people on kidney dialysis. I mean, that's a disparity in itself. Dr. Moskowitz, if someone's watching right now and wanted to um, say have they have stage three, stage four, explain to them what exactly do you do at Genomed Incorporated? Okay, well, first I should say, you know, what the stages are. Okay. Uh, stage one is above 90. If you have stage one, you're never going to go on dialysis. Stage two is between 60 and 90. If you're down around 60, 65, you need help. The help you should get is is go to genomed.com, our website, and click on Contact Us. Um, and uh, Or text me. It has my phone number there. Uh, just make contact with me. And I will get back to you uh, within, usually within hours uh, and guaranteed within 24 hours. Um, Then stage three is from 60 down to 30. And the lower you get, the worse it is. And stage four is 30 to 15. Stage five is below 15. Dialysis usually starts around five to 10. Um, although, um, you know, my Houston lady has been at 13, 12, she's just been stable around there, 11. Oh, 13, 12%. Yeah. 
She's she hasn't been in single digits. Oh wow! But wow. she feels fine, and she's really happy not to be on the machines. So we'll wow. just make it for as long. She's in her seventies, so you know we'll play for as long as we can. That is awesome. And that doesn't, um, she doesn't have any side effects as far as um, nausea, vomiting. No, she's doing fine. That is awesome. That is awesome. Um, so they people can go to genomed.com and, and get the information. Uh, and you can see anyone in the United States, correct? I can see anybody in the world. Oh, okay. Okay. Doesn't bother me. So if somebody in Pakistan mm -hmm. or India wanted to use you, um, as long as they got their currency as far as <laughs> they could get that to you, but not only that, but as far as long as they could um, I guess you do telemed or look at them that you can work with them. Well, I've already taken care of people in India and Pakistan. Really? And by email. I mean, we don't have to do, you know, face to face like we're doing. Email is plenty. And, and actually we could do uh, texting on WhatsApp, which is free. Um, so, so I really can take care of anybody anywhere. Okay, it's the main That's the game thing, changer. yeah, the main thing is they have to be able to buy quinapril, and and that unfortunately is not the case in a lot of places. Which me, which brings me to point number two, which th is that this would be a tremendous opportunity for any generic drug maker out there who's listening, because I want essentially I want to put the world's 2 billion adults on quinapril. I want to create an enormous market for quinapril and to a lesser extent, fludrocortisone, Florinef. Both those drugs are generic and um, should be a penny a pill so that everybody in the world can afford them. And these help with uh, renal, uh, chronic kidney disease. Those are the two drugs I use for chronic renal failure. I mean, India is supposed to have 300 million diabetics, half of whom will go on dia dialysis, and China, the same thing. And Africa wow. has 1.3 billion, and they're going to have a huge amount of dialysis too. And right now, um, uh, let's see. Right now, sorry, my power went out. Um, right now, uh, the... Uh, ISN, the International Society of Nephrology, is licking its chops because of these enormous numbers of dialysis patients. But, um, you know, 20 years ago, when they were talking about the need for dialysis in developing countries, I told them about my work, and they said there weren't enough rooms at the Italian villa where this uh, conference was being held. And I called up that Italian villa, and they had three extra rooms. Wow. I guess they didn't want that information to get out there. The ISN is evil. These guys are evil. <laughs> right. Wow. So as I wrap, get ready, uh, wrap up the show, Doc, what do you want people to know about uh, kidney disease and, and, and what you do? I, I think I want uh, people to know that nephrology is evil. Uh, do not trust your nephrologist because he wants you in his stable of dialysis patients. And if you're seeing a nephrologist, you need to see me. You need a second opinion with a, a, a nephrologist who actually cares about you and can keep you off the machine especially if you get to me soon enough. Mm, absolutely. Wow. I, I, I'm just kind of appalled why, you know, 
alternative treatments are are not being considered that are are safe and uh your your uh treatment has been researched correct it's been documented oh yeah i published a thousand patients in 2002 i'm up to about four thousand now wow that's a lot of patients it's not so, enough i mean I want to make the world dialysis free with your help, Steve. I think. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, Dr. Masters. We're going to do that. And again, I look forward to having you, you know, back on once or twice a month to discuss uh, these issues in nephrology and dialysis. Well, I'd, I'd love to be back. You have asked fantastic questions and uh, you're your audience has asked great questions, and I think we'll get the story out. Oh, I look forward to that. It, it, it needs to be told. Um, there needs to be other uh, avenues for patients to try out uh, other than the regular status quo, uh, a second opinion at, at least, because mm -hmm. there's more than one way to skin a cat. <laughs> right. Well... The only, the only way to skin the cat uh, has been going on for 25 years, way too long. And I think at least 20 million people have died as a result of nephrologies paying no attention to my protocol. Mm. I, right. I will not let nephrology off the hook here. I think they have really screwed people badly. And, and if I could, I would instigate a civil suit against them. Mm. Wow. All right. Well, Dr. David Moskowitz, thank you so much, CEO, founder of GenoMed. I really appreciate you uh, coming in tonight, being candid and talking about what you do and the renal field and definitely look forward to having you back in a, a couple of weeks. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. All right. I'll talk to you soon, Doc. All right. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. All right, guys. This was a great conversation. Look forward to many more conversations with uh, Dr. Uh, David Moskowitz, MD, out of Hollywood, Florida. Uh, thank you, Lord and Christ Ministries. I appreciate that. Guys, look, if you know anyone that's in stage two, three, four, even five kidney disease. And they may, and you think they could use the services of Dr. David Moskowitz. As he said, he can talk to anyone all over the world. All right, let me put his information back up here again. You can reach him at www.genomed.com. He's also on Facebook at Dr. at David Moskowitz, MD and also Gino Med, which is on Facebook, Gino Med Incorporated. I highly recommend you go on this page if you're dealing or you know someone dealing with kidney disease that haven't reached the point of renal failure. You never know what can happen. As Dr. Moskowitz said, he has a patient right now in Houston, Texas, that he has um, successively kept off of hemodialysis for two years. That could be you. So with that being said, thank you guys for watching Steve the Kidney Nurse. I'm Steve Belcher. Uh, join us for another episode next week. And until then, Stay blessed and encouraged, and your kidneys matter. All right. Thank you guys for watching. See you soon. Bye.
Ma, 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 ma,